Now here's the good news with which I'll close. The good news is that we are today right back where we started. In the first century, everything I've said of this culture could be said. In apostolic Christianity, of course, we had no clergy. They wouldn't be recognized for centuries. Cyprian of Carthage in AD 250 would coin the phrase clergy to call that one, to be separated from the laity, the laos, the people, in his desire to protect, he thought, the theological integrity of the church. A tragic mistake for the church to make. Imagine a hospital where only the CEO saw patients. Imagine a factory where only the president touched the product and you'd have the idea that most churches are trying somehow to follow. We didn't own buildings and so Constantine legalized the church in 313. The oldest building we can identify as having anything to do with the church is a house that was excavated in Seville, Spain. There's a cross etched on the wall of what we would call a living room, which is how we know a church met there. In the first century context, if you and I were having this conversation in first century Rome or first century Jerusalem, any place in a first century milieu, but especially out in the Greco-Roman world. Some of you would be followers of Zeus and the gods. Some of you would be adherents of the mystery cults. Some of you would be disciples of Aristotelianism. Some of you would follow Neoplatonism. Some would be Stoic, some Epicurean, some Cynic, some Skeptic. You'd have all this variety of ideas, Judaism and Christianity, only one of them. For me to stand up and quote scripture would make absolutely no sense to you. When Paul is at Mars Hill speaking to the intelligentsia of the day, he quotes not a single passage of scripture because they wouldn't care about scripture. He quotes their poets and leads them logically to the place where some of them come to Christ that very day. And one of the Dionysius, the Areopagite, is considered by the Greek Orthodox Church to be the founding father of their church 20 centuries later. In the first century, the church demonstrated the rightness of its faith by the relevance of its ministry. It was much more difficult then than today to abort a baby and have the mother survive. So unwanted babies were usually birthed and then abandoned. And so the church went to the trash heaps each night and rescued the babies and adopted, adopted them as their own. In first century Rome, it would have been virtually impossible to make slavery illegal. And so Christians bought slaves in the marketplace and set them free. In first century Rome, where women had no means of employment outside the home except prostitution, at least most of them, the church would welcome the prostitutes into their families and adopt them as members of their own and teach them a different craft. First century Christianity demonstrated the rightness of its faith by the relevance of its ministry. And by Acts 17, they had turned the world upside down and birthed the mightiest spiritual movement the world has ever seen. We're back where we started. When we feed the hungry, we earn the right to reach the culture. And that's very good news. I am a product of what I am suggesting today. Some of you know my story. David and I had talked about my sharing it as part of this. My father was a Methodist Sunday school teacher. Dad grew up in Kingman, Kansas, a little town outside of Wichita, Kansas. He was so active in his church that some of his friends thought he might wind up in the clergy and the ministry someday. When World War II started, Dad volunteered for the Army. He could type really well, so they made him a radio operator. I still have his World War II manual typewriter that he used. Got it sitting on my desk. I actually used it to type my papers on my MDiv at Southwestern Seminary when dinosaurs still roamed the earth and the planet had just cooled. The Army made Dad a radio operator and stationed him on the island of Bougainville in the South Pacific, a Japanese-occupied island. The Allies had carved out an area on the island where 300 men were stationed as a radio relay station. It was such a dangerous, difficult place, they were only supposed to be there three, for about six months and then they would be relieved. The Japanese began shelling, trying to knock out my father's radio. One day, one of the shells did kill the radio and killed most of the men. The Allies thought all of the men were dead and they were left on the island. Two and a half years later, three years total, the Allies were making the march through the South Pacific on their way to Japan and they came to Bougainville. 
where the original 300 that had been placed there, 17, were still alive. My father wanted them. My dad never went to church again. If there's a God, why is there war? That was his issue. I was raised in a loving, wonderful, moral home, Houston, Texas. But we had no spiritual life at all. If you'd asked me if I was a Christian, I would have said, well, I hope so or I think so. I thought what most Americans think, that if you're a good person who believes in God, you must be a Christian. If you're not Buddhist, Hindu, or Muslim, you must be a Christian. I was 15 years old. We were living in an apartment complex in the Sharpstown area. College Park Baptist Church. Got a new pastor in 1973. Back in those days, bus ministries were a trend. Anybody remember bus ministries? The church found an old school bus and painted the name of the church on the side, and Julian Unger and Tony McGrady went out knocking on doors trying to find kids to ride the bus to church. And so it was that they knocked on our apartment door and inviting my brother and me to ride the bus to church. We didn't want to go, but Dad heard the conversation, thought we ought to have some religion, and he told the guys we'd be on the bus the next day, and so we went on the bus the next day. My mother found a big clip-on tie as wide as my chest to wear and carried the big family Bible like you have on your coffee table under my arm. You don't stick out at all when you're 15 years old with a clip-on tie and a family Bible under your arm. Got home from church that day, put the Bible back, returned the tie. I'd been to church. I had no interest. I'd never heard an organ except at a Houston Astros baseball game. I'd never seen choir ropes. They're kind of funny looking if you've never seen them before. I had no background for any of this. No interest in any of this. I had all my father's questions, my father's issues. Dad and I talked a lot about the intellectual questions and struggles that were his, and they were all mine, too. By 10th grade, I knew that there were questions about creation and evolution and science and faith and what makes the Bible right and all the other religious books wrong. But the church kept reaching out to my brother and me. They kept inviting us to things. I knew a lot of kids in the youth group, and a number of them were friends of mine. We started going to some of the activities with our friends, went back to church, went to Sunday school. I began seeing something in them I didn't have in me. On September 9, 1973, after Sunday school that day, I asked my Sunday school teacher, who happened to be the pastor's wife, how I could have what they had. And she and I sat down in a folding metal chair, and she led me to faith in Christ. About six months later, my brother became a Christian. About a year later, Dad let us be baptized together. Mark's pastor of First Baptist Church in Gainesville now, up on the Oklahoma border, right on the edge of the foreign mission field there. <laughs> and I'm here again to talk to you today. If the church had come, not come to me, I never would have come to them. If they hadn't knocked on my door, I never would have knocked on their door. Ever. If they were waiting on me to decide that their message was right and therefore relevant, they would be waiting today. But the church reached out to somebody who wasn't hungry physically but was dying spiritually and demonstrated the rightness of their faith by the relevance of their ministry. And I will be eternally grateful that they did. And so I suggest to you, that the church must respond to hunger if the church wishes to reach this culture. And if we do not wish to reach the culture, we have no reason to be. Thank you for the privilege of the conversation with you today.